So the Jewish Funders Network is a, for those of you who might not be as aware, is a global organization for philanthropists to give through a lens of Jewish values. And one of those values that we are so strongly committed to is inclusion. And as a pluralistic organization, we value diversity and see opportunities for innovation and learning everywhere. We strive to create a more welcoming and inclusive Jewish community for anyone who identifies as Jewish. Um, at this time, I'm going to introduce our moderator, Ali Rose, and then we're going to get started with our conversation. So Ali is a senior manager at the Genesis Prize Foundation, and her primary responsibilities are public relations, laureate initiatives, and young adult engagement in, in North America. Ali previously worked at Hillel, the Foundation for Jewish Campus Life, as the director of the Office of the President, and prior to that, spent eight years at Booz Allen Hamilton, a management consulting firm based in Queen, Virginia. Her, experience, her expertise is in change management and strategic communication, and she currently resides in Cary, North Carolina with her family. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you so much, Melissa, for that introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be with you all this morning and talk to you about um, a, a topic that's important for the Genesis Prize and really also hear from our, our two rabbis to impart their, their wisdom and thinking to us as well. And, um, uh, you know, we hope to, to certainly in the latter part of the call um, to, to hear some questions and discussions uh, from you all participants, particip participants as well. Um, but before we get there, I just want to give a, a few minutes of background. Um, why am I here and why, why uh, is the Genesis Prize here? Um, for those of you who don't know, I just want to give a brief overview of what the Genesis Prize is. Uh, it's an annual $1 million award that's given to a single individual for outstanding achievement, their contribution to humanity, and finally commitment to Jewish life and to Israel. It was really envisioned as a new way to engage the next generation, as that's one of our primary goals. The vision and hypothesis being that if we can hold up um, those who have worked hard and really uh, achieved greatness in their life, and most importantly have contributed back, then um, young adults would, would aspire to do the same. In addition, one differentiator with our prize is that it's actually not like the Nobel. It, it doesn't end with that prize and that ceremony. We actually work with our laureates over the course of the year uh, after they receive the award on uh, a topic of uh, personal interest and meaning to them. So for example, we've, we've had four laureates win the prize so far, starting with uh, Michael Bloomberg in 2014, the first year of the prize. You know, something that, that um, Mr. Bloomberg was really passionate about was, was young people and was tikkun alam, contributing to the world. So we worked with him to develop a competition for young adult entrepreneurs who had ideas to better the world, which ultimately resulted in nine grants of, of $100,000 going to those teams to actually implement their vision. And then we worked with those teams over the course of the year to, um, uh, uh, again, implement and, and achieve their, their goals and their impact. The second laureate, Michael Douglas, whose theme is the focus of our webinar today, um, uh, chose to direct his funds to better inclusion of uh, those from intermarried families in Jewish life. Our third laureate, Itzhak Perlman, the world famous violinist, um, he also wanted to focus on inclusion, but in a little bit of a different way. He really wanted to focus on including those with disabilities in Jewish life. Um, so as we had with Michael Douglas, we actually worked with JFN to put together a matching grants program that would help organizations and funders come together uh, around this issue of including those with, with disabilities. And then finally, um, in the uh, last year, Anish Kapoor, the famous artist and sculptor, uh, decided to direct his award to the refugee crisis. We are still working with him on exactly who those grant recipients will be, but we actually just announced our first one last week, uh, and it will go to Ziv Hospital in the north of Israel that is treating um, uh, refugees from Syria. Uh, his, this grant specifically will go to a, a program to combat hearing loss among children. So, and then later in the fall, in another couple of months, we will be able to announce our, our fifth laureate and the program that will go along uh, with them. So stay tuned. 
what I want to now just take a minute or two of framing to do is um, uh, talk about, go back and talk about Michael Douglas and his focus on intermarriage uh, and just actually share a quick story. Um, upon first meeting with him, you know, our founder, Stan Polovitz, and his advisor, Jill Smith, in their very first meeting, one of the first things that Mr. Douglas said to them was, you know, I'm, I'm afraid that you've made a terrible mistake. You know, my mother isn't Jewish. Uh, and Stan and Jill looked at him and said, oh, we know that, <laughs> we've done our research. And from that point, it was clear how uh, this had been a pain point for Michael, really for his whole life, uh, not feeling fully included and fully, fully a part of the Jewish community. And having that moment of acceptance was really enough to push him to a place of, you know, uh, really wanting to contribute and to give back and, and frankly, continue to give that to, to, to his own children who are the product of an intermarriage, but feel um, uh, identify as Jews. So from that you know, point of personal reflection, we built with him a program with JFN that would allow us to um, you know, uh, engage other organizations and funders who are interested in this topic and really infuse significant amount of funding into uh, increasing this kind of programming. Um, the, the matching grant that we worked on with JFN ultimately received 81 applications from 14 countries representing 100 unique funders, suggesting that while we know this is a topic that's been discussed in the community, there is still so much need and so much desire for um, uh, including those from interfaith, house, interfaith households into the, the community at large. So um, we've had a great experience with the, the grant recipients as a result of this fund, and they're actually have already uh, implemented the first year of their grant, and we're starting to see some of the some of the results that these projects are having. So it's been a very exciting process for us. You know, we remain um, committed to the to to this issue as something that we want to further, which is why you know I, I'm I'm here and happy to be part of of this conversation today. Um, so I've already been talking for a long time, and now I'd really like to, to briefly introduce our two panelists, um, uh, Rabbi Amichal Laulavi and uh, Rabbi Avram Moltek. Um, uh, Rabbi Laulavi is the founding spiritual leader of Lab Shul NYC and the creator of Storytelling. Uh, he's an Israeli-born Jewish educator, writer, and performance artist, and received his ordination from JTS in 2016. And then Rabbi Moltek is a founder of Hillel's Base Program and the rabbi of base in downtown New York. Uh, he is, was listed as one of the most inspiring rabbis by the Forward in 2015 and in 2012 was on uh, the Jewish Week's list of 36 under 36. So now without further ado, Rabbi Amichai, I'd, I'd like to give you a chance to share a bit more about yourself uh, as a Jewish educator uh, and also share a little bit from your perspective uh, the different viewpoints of interfaith relationships and your personal beliefs on the topic. And then we'll have Rabbi Avram do the same thing. Great. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction and for being on this call. Uh, I'm just curious who's on the call. I'm assuming these are folks affiliated with JFN as professionals, as funders. Yes. It's, it's sort of hard to know who one talks to without knowing who one talks to. Oh, yes, sorry. Yes, those are, there are professionals and funders that are associated with JFN. Okay. Is it possible to know who's on? Names? Yes. Can we introduce I each other? I have. Please? What? Or, 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 uh, like either introduce each other or just the list. It just it would be nice to know who one talks to in addition to the faces I'm seeing. Um, I, I, I can, I can send it to you. Right, but I'd rather you keep going for now. Okay, sure. So, um, hello, Rabavram. Nice to see you, my friend. Um, and uh, look, we're in the middle of a high holy season, and uh, I'm sure you're all pretty busy. Um, I've been on uh, one of the many listservs I'm on is um, rabbis who are questioning the role of some of the prayers that have been part of the prayer book uh, for this moment in time. There's a prayer known as Aleinu, which is standard in many synagogues, um, which begins with a paragraph that celebrates the uniqueness and the particularity of the Jewish people and um, the distinction from other people. 
Some of the language in the original Hebrew is harsh. This is a medieval prayer that's made it into the liturgy. And rabbis of all denominations have been uh, disagreeing and discussing for the last three days, and way too many emails to my taste, three days before Yom Kippur, uh, what to do with this prayer. Um, it's a fascinating example of how we are looking at evolution and how we understand that as a Jewish people that's been around for thousands of years, we're not who our great-grandparents were fully. There are changes. So what does it mean to be a particular, unique celebrator of legacy and, heres and, the, and the heresy of what it means to be different in the 21st century when we are universal, when we've left the ghetto, when we are aspiring to be one with other and figure out that that balance is tricky. And I think that is at the core of what we're talking about here. Um, and I wanted to bring that example of the Aleinu because it really is on the minds and in the hearts of many, many people, uh, not just on this call, but throughout the Jewish world, quite frankly. Um, my story that leads to this uh, issue is simple. I grew up in Israel in a Zionist Orthodox household. The binaries of us and them were very clear. My father, who was a Holocaust survivor, had very clear uh, distinctions of who counts as we. And it was a very small charm circle of white, Galicianer, Polish, Orthodox Jews. Everybody else was other and uh, dealt with in various ways of uh, tolerance or less so. Um, as I grew up, um, I understood that um, that works for some part of me, but not for all of me. I came out uh, as gay in my late teens. I uh, had difficulty with halakha and orthodoxy that led in my early 20s to explore other more flexible and flexidox ways of being. Uh, and through art, through theater, through storytelling, through informal education, made my way to the rabbinate, to the Jewish Theological Seminary, and to the founding of Lab Shul which is a non-denominational congregation in New York City. Um, I joined JTS in the conservative movement, understanding that it is the middle ground of much of our discussions and ideologies, and as such, I, I aligned with it, the 2006 decision to uh, include LGBT students in the rabbinate was the straw that opened me to really say yes. The big challenge was uh, the notion of intermarriage, the big red line for conservative rabbis including uh, Orthodox rabbis and some Reform rabbis, is the officiation of intermarriage weddings. Um, my congregation, my community, people in my family, my close friends, some of my previous relationships have been with people who are of other faith and heritage. I'm uncomfortable with using non-Jews in the same way that I won't label some of my friends as non-gay. Um, so, um, but the notion of addressing the growing needs of our community and the growing diversity compelled me to think long and hard about how I would address this in my community. Uh, prior to my ordination, uh, two years ago, I uh, met with my board and members of my community to suggest that I will take myself off officiation of marriages um, for about a year while I come up with a solution. Um, I get between six and eight marriage um, invitations a week for officiation. About half of them are between Jews and people of other faiths. Uh, or no faith, as is often the case. Uh, my decision uh, led to a complicated conversation in the community, but eventually to a year-long process of study where I met with scholars, with uh, rabbis, with academics, with a team of uh, research assistants, and came out uh, this last June with a proposal called the Joy Proposal that looks into our history and to the way the Jewish civilization has responded to the blurring of boundaries over the generations. And briefly, I will suggest, and then hand it over to Rabavram and we can talk uh, further, is that the reality that we're looking at is not new. From the very beginning of the Jewish existence, there have been people who chose members of other civilizations to be part of their lives, households, marriages. Um, Jews responded to it in different ways. Uh, conversion evolved at some point. Uh, and other models of acceptance of exclusion. Um, there is a model in our history called Ger Toshav, permanent resident, um, or other ways of naming this status, who are not exactly Jewish and not exactly not Jewish. They're hybrids, they're in-betweens. 
Uh, we have records of those in the Talmudic era when rabbis were confronted with similar issues as we are, not in the numbers we are uh, facing today. So I went back to those original statuses, the Gil Toshav and a few others that exist in Jewish literature and proposed that uh, we should not be binary and black on white about this. Marriage, intermarriage, Jew, Goy. There is a middle ground and that middle ground I'm naming Joy. Joy is a Goy who's a Jew or a, joy, or a Jew who's a Goy. They are the many, many people who choose to marry us, to raise our children, to join our communities, to lead our institutions, and for any number of reasons, do not convert or do not convert yet. This is reflective of the more fluid sense of identity in the 20th, 21st century, certainly in the West. And these are very high numbers of people who show up, but don't necessarily join in the sense of conversion because of faith, because of theology, because of respect for their parents, because of being Jews in ways that are not necessarily um, the ways that, that we've known. And the Douglas family is one of many, many such examples, many such examples in my community. The Joy proposal was um, unveiled on June 13th uh, for my community in the presence of Stephen M. Cohen, the sociologist who has issues with it, but supports the direction with Anita Diamond, who's one of the key thinkers and writers on this issue of marriage and inclusion and with many other leaders and thinkers. Uh, subsequently, I resigned from the Rabbinical Assembly of the Conservative Movement so that I can be there for my community and not um, tarnish the, the tradition of a conservative movement who at present is grappling with this issue and trying to come up with other solutions. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, uh, again, in these days of Teshuvah and return, I think we as a Jewish people have a lot of Teshuvah and reflection to do on how we handle this, how we welcome each other and others into our community and how we step away from any forms of otherism and dare I even say racism that are part of the conversation that is at the, at the, in the, the ballpark of this conversation on marriage and intermarriage and it's upon us to be way more sensitive, inclusive, and welcoming without losing the link to where we come from and not saying yes to all and every, being specific, which is why my joy solution is saying yes to those who say yes to Judaism, even if they do not convert. And those are growing numbers. So there's room for nuance here. This is not an either or conversation. And I hope with that, we can hand it over to my esteemed colleague who's got a much harder task than I, considering where you come from and who you work with. Thank you. Shalom, Gemar Tov, everyone. It's an honor to be included. I think the Gemara talks about, uh, you know, what it's like to, to, to talk or to teach in front of one's teachers and likens that to being in a fiery furnace. So it's, it's a zchut, a privilege to be here with you, Rav Um You know, I grew up in between Jewish dichotomies. I grew up speaking Yiddish. Yiddish was my first language, my my mom, Aloshan, not because I grew up in an ultra-Orthodox or Haredi home, but because my father came from a secular and passionately cultural Jewish home of Yiddish cultural activists, you know, that my father's family growing up would celebrate Pesach, but, and in the Haggadah, there was no mention of God whatsoever. It was Yiddish worker songs. And my mother came from a modern Orthodox background. And we, as their children, you know, got to be the guinea pigs and experience the best and worst of all these, of all these worlds, from Camp Ramah to Reform Youth Groups to Young Israels. We always had Shabbat and a type of kashrut in the home, but it was a quite, quite of an eclectic upbringing because we would also go to experience Yiddish cultural festivals. Um, you know, while I was at uh, Cheder, at, uh, at a Chabad seminary, because they wanted me to be in a Yiddish immersive speaking environment. And so at these klezmer festivals would encounter Jews of color and non-Jews and queer Jews, and then would go back to, um, to the Chabad Cheder, you know, after, after the break. And so as a kid, it was pretty dissonant, although, you know, you go wherever your parents send you as a child. And now I, I cherish that. Uh, that dissonance because it, it totally informed who I am and my rabbinate and my belief in the plurality of, of Judaism, of Yiddishkeit, but also the oneness of the, of the Jewish people, of the Jewish family. And uh, for me, that's, that's how I, I, I prefer to, 
to call us if we're going to call us anything, which is a, a family. I think of my my great grandfather, who was a Malamed. He was a Judaic studies teacher in a shtetl outside of Warsaw. And if you were to see a picture of him, he looks like a typical uh, traditional Orthodox Jew with a long beard and a hat. And he taught Limude Kodesh, you know, Bible and Talmud, but he also taught mathematics and astrology. And his wife, Feige, oversaw the family sewing business. And their children were Bundists and socialists and communists and Zionists and religious and secularists. And I try to imagine what the conversation around that Shabbat table must have sounded like. Um, for me, that's how I, how I approach, approach Yiddishkeit, uh, that there's room for everyone, no matter who you are, um, at the Shabbos table. And uh, that's really the ethos that's led me to my work at BASE, which is a project that I, f I founded along with my, my partner, my wife, Yael, uh, and our dear friends, John and Faith. And we pitched this project to Hillel International's Office of Innovation, asking what would it look like to empower pluralistic rabbinic families, meaning a rabbi and a rabbi's partner. And that rabbi could be queer, straight, conservative, renewal, reform, but open their homes um, and had their home serve as convening points for Jewish life, gathering around Shabbat, living the Jewish holidays, learning and community service. This the, stemming from the idea that it shouldn't only be our ultra-Orthodox brothers and sisters who can exhibit radical hospitality, but that it should really reflect the diversity of the Jewish people. And that's what I've been doing the past two years. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a newbie here, uh, a newly minted ordained rabbi just two years out, and have been doing this work of opening our home in Lower Manhattan and uh, as part of BASE and, and has, the, the movement has now grown to other cities in Chicago and Miami and in Berlin in the summer times, but uh, creating a movement of, of home-based uh, Jewish communities, you know, specifically targeting those young folks post-college, not quite married yet, not quite comfortable uh, to walk into a house of worship for whatever reason, but we're still seeking community and learning and, um, and, and so that's what I've been doing. And, um, you know, as I guess a, an entry into, into this, into our subject today of rethinking our resistance to intermarriage, you know, I, um, I, 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 I think of my great aunt who married, uh, who married a non-Jew and my great grandfather who sat a Shiva for her when she did so. And although the family lore is that she would, you know, he would sneakily read the letters that she, that his daughter would write home to, to her mother at the time. Um, so, uh, you know, come from an Orthodox, uh, an Orthodox background where um, it was as traif as, as traif. But um, in my own work, you know, as part of base and staffing a couple of trips for Honeymoon Israel, which is a, an organization that brings multi-faith families to Israel for a 10-day, highly immersive experience, um, have just encountered the thirst and yearning for entry, which I find to be maddening. You know, religion is crazy. Who wants to be, who, who wants to like join our ranks these days? I mean, unless, I mean, the Pope has given us a, a pretty, pretty prominent and positive model of, of religious leadership, but look at the disasters and violence that's been wreaked in the name of religion. And yet I, here I was encountering um, these young families who had never encountered Shabbat before, who, you know, who were curious about their, um, their partner's Judaism, but didn't have a synagogue or community to go to, to explore that part of uh, their partner's background. And, um, and have been taken in by, by that. And so in my work, in addition to your serving, you know, the, your, your typical young Jewish professional, 20s, 30s, trying to find community, I've also uh, been starting to work with multi-faith uh, couples and, and families. And this has put me, you know, somewhat at odds with my, um, with where I was ordained and the community, some of the communities of origin that I come from, although in others, it, it's, a, it's a natural ex extension. Um, you know, the, gone are the days where, um, you know, you do, you do Jew because that's what your rabbi told you. I, I really believe these days that everyone is a Jew by choice. And uh, it's upon our traditional communities. And here I'll include the conservative and orthodox communities of which I, I do feel a part 
to, to, to model the type of radical hospitality that we see in the Gemara so, so beautifully exhibited by, by Hillel Hazakim, you know, Hildur, the, Hillel the elder sage. And how that translates vis-a-vis who I'll marry or, you know, membership dues or, um, you know, baby namings is something that I'm, uh, as at the beginning of my career, I'm just starting to figure, figure out. But I will tell you that, you know, in my, in my short, you know, entry into this, into these tumultuous waters, I've found that what can be gained by, by hospitality and, and, and invitation is much more than, than uh, what can be gained when you close, when you close the door to these families and couples. So I'll stop there for now. Thank, thank you both for sharing a little bit about your personal background. Um, I think it's always really kind of um, uh, helpful and also, you know, encouraging and enlightening to hear about what personally draws you to this topic and why it's personally meaningful to you. Um, so thank you for opening up and, and sharing that. Um, you know, I'd like to start with a question, which, you know, is a common question in our tradition. Why, of course, you know, why, why is it important for us to have conversations like this? And why is it important for us to um, uh, make sure we're talking about, you know, some on this webinar might feel like we've talked, we, we've talked about this before. Hasn't, hasn't this been a conversation that's ongoing in the community for so, so long? When have we reached the you know, the, the pinnacle. Um, but why is it important to continue, to continue talking about um, inclusiveness and, and making sure that, that those um, from intermarried backgrounds are feeling inclusive and included and welcomed? <laughs> why, seems, why live? Seems obvious. Seems like, obvious. your perspective, Rabbi, how about Rabbi Lalavi? What are we here to do? What's our purpose? Like, are we here to um, focus on me and what I need and what I want and what my people want and limit me and my to the small circle of the people I know? Or am I part of something bigger, which is the human planetary invitation to what we call tikkun olam, to be part of a world that is better? There's a story in the Talmud about a ship full of cabins and one person in one of the lower cabins decides to dig a hole in his cabin and the ship goes down. And as it goes down, the people ask him, what are you doing? And he said, but it was my cabin. I paid for it. And I think in this, in our age of selfie and in our age of growing divides with people really just looking to with much confusion, like there's so much out there. We're more globally connected than ever. And that's a blessing. It's also a perplexing challenge. Who's my we? What's my sense of we? What is the circle that I stand with that offers me protection, that I can go to for consolation, that I can celebrate marriages to and be around the Sabbath table to and there when it hurts and there when it's, when it's wonderful? Who's my we? Um, that's a complicated question in the 21st century and many people of different faiths and cultures are asking that as we are blurring across cultures and faiths and races and nationalities. And we know that in this country right now, as in many other countries, there is a strong voice to put walls up and to not be everybody friendly and inclusive, but be more exclusive for both good and complicated reasons. I think the Jewish people are in a moment of great evolution. Uh, the 20th century brought us the horrors of the Holocaust and the miracle of Israel. It brought us, unlike almost ever before in our history, the numbers of people exposed to wisdom and to our tradition through so much technology and to, because of feminism and the ability of people of all ages and genders to tap into Judaism. And like Rabbi Avram said, people want this. We've got something good here. We've got a good toolbox for how to make your life meaningful and to make our biggest purpose one of intention and joy and going to sleep at night feeling good about making this world better and my life better. That is what Judaism has to offer the world. In my opinion, the end goal, the end of the, the bottom line is not Jewish, the bottom line is human. And the fact that so many people in unprecedented numbers in our history, according to sociologists, are choosing love over tribe, but not necessarily instead of tribe. 
And so many people of other cultures are choosing to step in and discover and explore what Judaism has to offer to them is a gift. It's a gift. And in order for us to fulfill our purpose and be a light onto and with other nations, it is up to us to challenge some of the assumptions that have been with us for generations that might no longer work. You know, women have been in leadership positions for less than a century. That is new for Judaism and for the human race. LGBT leaders are around, and we are grateful, for only several decades. There are new conversations about what it means to be human, to be Jewish, and the notion of opening our doors with love and be, as um, Rabbi Zeldin of blessed memory said, we need to be more like ports and less like forts. I think that's the why, because that's going to be the richer experience that will invite more of us in, will sustain our future, and will be fluid and durable as we move forward into God knows what is coming up. If I can just echo, you know, the why is, is a, 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 as to this conversation or to greater inclusion is a much larger why, if we're going to ask that question, because then it's a why does the Torah say 36 times to welcome in or to not oppress the other, the stranger? Why is it that every Pesach gathering around our Seder table, we say, let all who are hungry come and eat? Um, you know, it's why, the why there is, I think, as, as Rav Michai uh, says, is getting to the core of what Judaism is about, which is to be an Ola Goyim. And in order to be a light unto the world, to share that, to share that light, and whatever Torah and truth that may be, you have to then interact with the world. And the world is ever evolving and ever changing as Judaism is as well. But I think in order for our more, our more traditional communities to, to enter this conversation in a meaningful way, and here I'll just speak from, for, you know, in my tiny Orthodox bubble, that means engaging uh, around, you know, roles of women, around women's roles, LGBTQ inclusion, multi-faith families, um, how we respond, for, uh, you know, from, uh, from, to the social justice crises of our, of our time. These, you know, these, these pieces have to be seen as, as just as compelling um, as how we're going to keep kosher or how we're going to observe Shabbat or how we're going to pray or if not, if not more so. Uh, so, you know, the why, the why is um, I think important, but, but, but I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't understand, a, um, you know, an argument of, of why not, you know, the great, the great medieval uh, philosopher Rashi says a city that is truly strong doesn't have walls, um, you know, and, and how we might, how we might, how we might engage with that, with the world that's growing. And it's, and I agree, it's not about saying necessarily saying yes to, to everything, but um, you know, I think of like everything that the iPhone has obliterated in the past 10 years from calendars to compasses to clocks, you know, um, we have some wisdom that's endured. We have a shofar as a spiritual alarm clock that's endured those thousands, uh, those thousands of years. And so it's upon us to think creatively about how we're going to share this Torah if we really believe it as what to offer to the world. So it's interesting, both of you, I, I like that your response was one of, I would interpret it as, well, isn't it obvious? Um, I don't know that everyone in the community might approach that question in the same way. And so I'm wondering if you have thoughts about, you know, given the fact that there is some resistance, you know, given the title of our webinar, we know it exists. I'm wondering if, you know, both of you have uh, thoughts, suggestions, thought a little bit about what needs to change in the community so that the aspiration that you're describing really comes to pass for not just some, but a much larger majority of the community. Um, I just want to say before I get into that, um, Rav Avram took a very strong position by coming out and saying to even think about intermarriage in a positive way in the Orthodox community. Um, and I'm not sure what price you've paid. We haven't had a chance to really debrief about it, my friend, and where, how that affects you. Uh, I can tell you that for me, um, the loss of mentors, friends, colleagues who 
Um, my, my task this morning, other than this call, is to compose a bunch of pre Yom Kippur letters to people in the conservative movement who are pretty pissed at me um, and coming from love. So I just want to acknowledge the pain that a lot of people who are not on the same page as Avram and myself and some of us may be on this call, there's a great pain here. There's a great fear. There's a sense of what we are losing by saying yes and not just by what we're gaining. And I want to acknowledge that because the gap between the ideal and the real what is the ideal Jewish and what is the reality out there? What is ideal vision for humanity and what's out there? The gaps are real. And that's where the pains are. And I, and I honor those hurts. And for my family and friends and colleagues and teachers, the, the sense of the loss is palpable. And the confusion about what this means is, is profound and needs to be respected. And I respect it deeply. Um, if you're asking what can help us move forward gently and wisely, I think it's a few things. Um, you mentioned the iPhone, and um, I'm thinking that one of the big issues for us in the 21st century is the gift of the 20th century gift of consumership. People are coming to life as consumers. Is it good for me? What am I getting out of it? Where's the bonus? Um, that is, again, a real but a selfish way of dealing with life. When people come to a rabbi, to a congregation, to a priest, to their senator with as consumership, we're losing the sense of solidarity, community responsibility, and diversity. And so I think for our community at large, if it's JFN and if it's the Jewish denominations and if it's the beyond denominations and the huge numbers of people who are not denominationally affiliated, to understand that we're truly in this together, not as consumers, but as co-creators. That we're gonna to have to respect each other's different needs and disagree respectfully. We're seeing that around the intermarriage issue. We're seeing it around Israel issues. We're seeing it around political issues. We have lost the art of disagreement with respect. And it's, it's very either or, and it's very black or white, and that's toxic. So I think this issue has to happen because it's happening. We cannot look away. The demographics are such that this is who we are how to talk about these issues with respect and with attention to each other's pains and yearnings is key to us really being able to move forward together, even if we're not on the same page. You know, at, at, um, I, the, at this point in my, in my own professional career, I haven't, I haven't performed any uh, multi-faith or interfaith uh, uh, weddings. You know, I've I've been asked to um, to perform baby namings, uh, you know, and and the like, and I, and I've done those, but um, you know, at, at this point, I, I, I and I've said this in my in follow-up uh, interviews, you know, that I've had since I wrote a piece that that again just. Raised, raised an antenna about talking about this in different ways. But what I said in follow-up interviews, I said, at this point in my understanding of halakha, um, I don't perform interfaith weddings, you know? And it pains me to say that. I, I'll, I'll work with a couple to craft what that ceremony might look like, and I will um, and, and we'll welcome that, that, the, that couple into my, into my community before and after, but there's a part of me that feels like I'm being disingenuous because I'll, I will say that, but I won't be with you on the day of. And so I, I, I look towards what, um, what my colleagues in the conservative movement are doing, whether it's Amichai or the rabbis at, at Bnei Yishurin, of, of, of taking this nuanced approach, which isn't, um, which isn't saying, uh, you know, um, yes to everything, but it's acknowledging the people who are interested in, in building a Jewish home um, and wanting to do so and, and trying to, to offer creative out, uh, ways of, of still being a part. And I, I, um, I think that the religious courage that that takes is, is far greater than where I and, and, and most others in the Orthodox community uh, are at this, point, at this point. You know, and I agree that our religious communities are probably growing just as polarized as our political communities are. And it does a tremendous disservice to... to both the religion and to and to our and to our relationship, which is which is uh, which is at stake. You know, we've 
we've lost the ability to to disagree with the, the blogosphere has removed the human being from before us so we can write um, however how, you know however bitingly we might so choose um, without having to acknowledge the human being uh, that might be behind that you know that article or that 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 post and in the same way we can talk about these the, the, you know uh, our resistance to intermarriage as an idea, but we're also talking about human beings and couples um, who are seeking to build a Jewish home. So, I, I, you know, um, I, I'll just echo, you know, of course, the, the pushback has been tremendous within, within the Orthodox community. Um, but, I, I, you know, I find it so striking, you know, the, uh, for our New Yorkers, I don't know if people are, if everyone on this call are New Yorkers, but, you know, the, the mind, the gap that the the, the a subway announcement uh, will say when you're exiting the subway platform, I'm always struck by like, by the gap between what our Jewish community and our Jewish community leaders are talking about versus say what like the people, the Jews and the joys or whoever it is that we're encountering are talking about. Um, I'd say, yeah, some maybe might be interested in, in, in the halachic parameters of, of what, uh, of, of intermarriage and the like. But people are thinking about, yeah, how do I stay connected to the people in front of me as I'm connected all the time to my iPhone, right? They're looking for love and for learning and meaning and not, and not as engaged um, in, in this. And, I, and while statistically, you know, we can point to studies that have shown that, um, that uh, you know, you can point to whatever study you might want to show, right? But uh, my colleagues will often point to me, they'll say that intermarriage leads to a higher rate of uh, uh, you know, lesser rate of Jewish affiliation among the, these families, um, it again ignores the, that the statistic ignores the person. Um, and it doesn't really account for what my response is then going to be when I, when I encounter these, these couples and families. So thank you both for, for your, um, your insightful comments. I, I actually want to take now that we're about, we have about 15 minutes left uh, uh, in the webinar. We do have a few more questions, but I actually want to pause for a minute and, and see if there are any questions from our, our funders and partners who are joining us on the phone for, for either, of our, either of our speakers. Great. I'm about to, I'm going to unmute everyone and that way, if anyone has a question, they should feel free to ask it. Give me one sec. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Okay, Alan. Um, Alan, do you want to ask your question live? Alan, do you want to unmute? Alan? Okay, I'll ask it. Um, Avram, this is for you. Do you ever think that you may reach a point where you will be able to solemnize interfaith relationships within a halakhic framework in a similar way to how Rav Abichai did with joy? Why, or do you think that you will focus on trying to maintain a respect for diversity? Um. You know, they're my two most favorite stories in, uh, one of my two most favorite stories in the Chumash are when uh, the daughter on the Bible or when the daughters of Tzlofchad come before Moshe asking for their inheritance, um, you know, because there aren't any sons, which is where their father's uh, inheritance would typically and traditionally go. And also when a group of Israelites come before Moses and ask about observing uh observing Pesach, uh, a pa Passover, but they didn't, for whatever reason, weren't able to, to offer the Paschal lamb in time. And in both cases, Moses basically says the equivalent of, I don't know. He says, wait here for a second. Let me check in with God. And God deems the, the request of Salofed's daughters to be just. And so too with the, with, the, um, with, the, with the parishioners who come before Moses asking about the Pesach offering and Pesach Sheni. The idea of a second Passover is, is born, but um, that's the most honest answer I can offer at this point. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm figuring, I'm figuring it out, you know, I, and I think I'm in, in one of my conversations with you, Rabbi Michai, you once te teasingly said that traditional communities have to grapple with, you know, um, how we're going to treat uh, gals, gays, and goys. And I forget the order of which that, that you, um, you put it. But if I'm going to be completely honest, as I look at the Orthodox community, uh, higher on my, on, my, um, on my personal radar is, is the role and inclusion of women and the LGBTQ community. 
um, uh, followed by our, our treatment of multi-phase families. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question that they want to ask at this time? You've all muted yourself, but you, I can unmute you if you'd like. Doesn't look like it. Allie, you want to do one more? Sure, sure. I actually... Um, um, Unless you have a, a non-scripted question? Um, I, uh, I have one more question that I think um, that I think would be helpful with this group, given that we are talking to JFN members and funders who are interested in this topic. I'd love to hear from both of you on um, uh, what you think JFN um, as an organization of philanthropists, but even individual philanthropists, what they might be able to do to um, continue to um, move this conversation forward again, you know, towards some of the aspirations that you both articulated. Um, I'm not uh, aware of what has been the conversation at JFN in recent years, where it stands. Um, so it's hard for me to say about what should be done further. Um, I will um, repeat what I said earlier. Can there be containers and arenas for respectful, profound, learned conversations about this issue that does not include knee-jerk reaction and um, quick responses, but um, a real opportunity for exploration of where we come from, where we are, and wh where we need to go. I think that those convenings need to happen as often as possible. And um, again, I think the, um, the level of confusion and fear often supersedes the notion of respect and love and possibility that comes when we really give this conversation its due place. Yeah, I, I also just, you know, I, um, it's, I, I really appreciate the, the level of nuance that Ravami Chai noted in the beginning, which is that not all intermarriage is equal. Right, you can have, and that's I think what you even see that within reform communities, right? Of reform uh, clergy who who may not uh, officiate or co-officiate um, at um, at ceremonies uh, at at interfaith ceremonies. You know, um, from what I understand of Amichai of Rav Amichai's approach now is that you know it's 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 geared towards families who are committed to building a, or having a holding a Jewish home in whatever capacity. Um, and so I think that level of nuance is important to bring into the conversation when we're thinking about these, this, this, and also that, you know, that we're, again, just that we're talking about human beings, the, the notion of like inter anything feels like a science fiction, religious science fiction premise uh, to me, that we're talking about people uh, with, real, with real human emotions um, at, at stake. So to, to approach it with that type of um, yeah. event, I think would be crucial, whatever our involvement will be. And I want to say just one more thing, if I may. I was on the phone yesterday with a fairly prominent Orthodox rabbi in Israel who is one of the many I've had conversations about this. And the original premise was that this is not an issue. Intermarriage is not an issue that pertains to Israel. And what this rabbi told me is that that's actually no longer the case, that there are increasing numbers of Israelis who are either anywhere in the world or in Israel who've met people of other cultures uh, including people in Israel who are choosing to marry them despite the rabbinate and uh, find new, what we'll call intermarried forms of building homes. Um, there was a very famous case a couple uh, months ago of a, an Israeli singer who herself is from a Muslim Arab uh, Israeli town from Nazareth who is about to get married to her drummer who is a Shah observant Jewish man. She's not becoming Jewish. He's not becoming Muslim. It was a big piece on TV, and I was uh, uh, interviewed about it later. Um, this is an issue that is only going to grow. And while the ultra-Orthodox and the, uh, to extent the Orthodox community is growing because of um, healthy procreation, and um, the liberal community is not so much doing so, there is room for us to again, get beyond the fears and get into a global conversation about eyes wide open and hearts wide open 
to figure out the and or both and not the either or. Okay, well, we thank you both for that. We have about seven minutes left. Just want to make sure that there's no, there are no other questions. Doesn't look like there are. Um, I want to give both of you the opportunity to say, you know, one final thing, anything else that you've thought of that you want to share with our group today, if there is anything. I'm just looking at Alan's comment that he posted. Oh, did he post something else? Um, but to follow up, philanthropy can support uh, foreign, which physical issue can be explored. What, what venues are currently doing this? Did you develop joint connection with any of these networks? Uh, Alan, good question. Oh. Uh, I'm not fully, I'm, it's hard to tell. I have to say that I'm delighted for this, in, I was delighted for this invitation. Um, there have been a lot of private conversations with various people, both leaders in our community um, and uh, just individuals. I, I think it will be fantastic to, for JFN and for other leading national organizations to bite the bullet and say, let's talk about this um, and invite uh, key leaders and key thinkers and people who are the, in the trenches to uh, examine the pros and cons with this. Um, so thank you for that. I think this, this could be that, that invitation. I'm gonna share a super short anecdote with you. The first wedding between a Jew and a Joy that I officiated was earlier in June between a gay couple, uh, one of them in his 60s and the other in his 50s. They've been together for 16 years. If you read the New York Times style section, it was on the front page with lots of photos. Uh, it's a beautiful couple, one of them born Jewish, the other not, both of them Zen Buddhist leaders who've been in my community for about five years and who've increasingly come to really love what Jewish has to offer them and to include that together with their Zen practice. Um, that was the wedding for which I left the RA. I could not say no to them. They're my teachers, they're my friends, they do Shabbat, they include Jewish teachings in how they do Zen. And Chodo, who is the partner of a Christian descent, came to me after leading Slichot together two weeks ago as a Zen Jewish practice of meditation and forgiveness and said, first of all, I've mastered the Ch, so I can now say Slichot and I can do Amichai and I can do Lechaim and I'm very proud. And B, when does our Judaism 101 course begin? Because I don't know if I'm going to convert, but I want to learn more and I'm ready. And that was because we said yes and because we met them where they were at and honored their path and welcomed them in. Chodo is leading a meditation and a teaching on Zohar and Zen on Yom Kippur. The Saturday is leading Fila with us for Neila, and we're starting the Jew 101 called Aleph Bet in November. So in according to what Rav Avram said and what we all know, saying yes opens doors. Saying no closes them. So in the spirit of Yom Kippur, when Neila comes, some doors will close but it's up to us to open as many as we can. We'll begin Yom Kippur by saying, before Kol Nidre, uh, we've come to pray. We've come to pray with all the, the, the sinners, as it were, um, but uh, giving us license to, to, to sort of to pray with, and with among those we might staunchly, vehemently disagree. But what I love most about uh, that formulation that gets recited before the Kol Nidre is, is the Banu, is that we've come, is that we've showed up, is that we're here. And in this, I think of a story, I think of uh, a young woman who I met on this trip of Honeymoon Israel, who when she told her parents that she was engaged to a non-Jewish man, uh, they stopped receiving her phone calls and they stopped responding to her emails and they didn't show up to their wedding. And her partner, her non-Jewish partner was eager to incorporate Jewish rituals into the, cere the day's ceremony. Um, and she was, and she, she was too hurt to, to even to, to entertain the, the, the mere thought and idea. And they're coming on this trip with sort of a last hurrah, as it were, to see if there might be a space for them, to see if there might be a, a, a community uh, for them. Um, just as someone who grew up in a, in a traditional conservative uh, home, you know, so, as we know, and, and, this, and, and even among the most, the, the most religious of, of, of onlookers would know that her, this, this daughter's, you know, this, their daughter's children will, they'll have quote unquote halachically Jewish grandchildren. So the, the death warrant that, that, that so many in the Jewish community seem to view intermarriage 
uh, as I think is, 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 is so misguided and misplaced. But um, long story short, the last Rosh Hashanah, this past Rosh Hashanah, she joined us, um, she joined us in shul for, for, for tefillah. And she'll be holding uh, this, the Sefer Torah for us, come Kol Nidre night tomorrow evening. Um, and I, I think that I, we have to sort of remember, remember just that, that, you know, the posture of, the posture of, of Hillel Hazakens of saying, um, you know, to love, to love each other and the rest is commentary is what will, I think, the only way that will prove our, our um, uh, you know, our sustainability. I'm loath to, th- to think what, like, what all the, you know, what these hurricanes and natural disasters that we've encountered, uh, that our world has encountered these past couple of of weeks and months of what they may mean, you know, and so often our religious leaders will ascribe a certain human behavior to, to these natural phenomenons. Um, but one piece that I'm left thinking about is, you know, is that, you know, if these, if these natural events are show the disasters are showing us anything, uh, it's that we need each other in a very bare human uh, way. And um, that's, that, that, that crosses faith lines, sexual orientation lines, denominations and the like. Uh, and so that's the ethos that I'd like us to, 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 to enter Yom Kippur for sure with, and hopefully this, this new year as well. Thank you. Thank you Amen. both for giving your time. I know this is a tough time to be doing anything that's not Yom Kippur related. Thank you, Ali, for being a wonderful partner in this work that we're doing together and for also giving your time. Um, I want to thank everyone who's on the call for you know, making the time being part of this conversation. It is a topic that we are not abandoning by any means. And so we're excited to continue this work with all of you. Wish you a meaningful Yom Kippur if you are celebrating, if you are not. Um, have a lovely weekend. And thank you again. Thank you. Shana Tova. Thank you for organizing this.